Well, Dr. Elaine Aron, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon in my time and the morning for you where you are. The reason that I wanted to connect with you today was to think about, to talk about how a highly sensitive person might be responding to uh, the current pandemic, which would include a fear of illness, the social isolation, um, and what, what might be coming up in their therapy. And before we do that, I thought it might be quite interesting to, to give a, a, a kind of loose definition of a highly sensitive person as opposed to perhaps a traumatized person or a person who's experienced kind of ineffective parenting, if you like. Right. Good. Hi, Alice. This is great to be doing this. I'm really happy to be giving any help I can to the therapists there and here because I imagine some therapists all over the world will end up watching this, which would be great. This is a little mini uh, introduction to what we're going to do on July 25th about therapy in general with highly sensitive people where you'll get the research and much more depth, but at least maybe this will help, help you know whether or not you would like to get more in that way. Mm. So what is a highly sensitive person? Well, I talk about it in terms of four four aspects and I've made this acronym when I was writing this book psychotherapy and the highly sensitive person I um, realized that I'd been talking about four different aspects for a long time but I should say first that this is an innate trait we know it's heritable and when I say we there's now over 80 90 research studies not just mine on on high sensitivity it's also called environmental sensitivity michael pluis in the uk there is um, doing a lot of the research it's also called biological sensitivity to context so and you're going to hear the term differential susceptibility these are all key terms in understanding this trait which is found in about 20 to 30 percent of the population and in over a hundred other species we see this this division kind of into a minority and a majority. Equal numbers of men and women. It's not the same as introversion because we find 30% of highly sensitive people are actually extroverts. Mm -hmm. And also um, there can be, you can be a high sensation seeker and have this trait, which you would think the opposite would be, um, high sensation seeking would be the opposite of sensitivity, but it's not actually because the opposite of, of sensitivity would really be impulsivity. And there are high sensation seekers who are highly sensitive who are not impulsive. They think through all the risks before they do. They're very exciting activities such as hang gliding or um, some of them are police officers and they enjoy that kind of thing, but they do it so carefully and thoughtfully. Why is this? Because of those four letters, D-O-E-S, does or does. D stands for depth of processing. And this is the key trait about sensitive people is they process things deeply. And that's not just conscious, but unconscious. And that's why um, I'll just say right now, important to us, those of us who are depth therapists, is that they have more vivid dreams. And I have this uh, quite um, clear from research. And I think they're also more in touch with the archetypal level of life, if you're into Jungian ideas. And I think that plagues are an archetype. Plague. They come with an instinct on how to behave and all the emotional paraphernalia that comes with it. And that's some of what you're getting, no doubt, in therapy with anyone who's highly sensitive, is, is that whole archetype. And there's a, another book, it's only two books I'll wave at you. No, that's <laughs> okay. Is, is um, Boundaries of the Mind by Ernst Hartman, which was actually written in 1991 and he sent me a copy as soon as he heard about my research it's another very good way of looking at sensitivity and he talks a lot about dreams and the unconscious being more available to people with thin boundaries and that's another thing we're talking about if you're going to process things deeply you have to have accessibility or your processing creates that accessibility 
we have a lot of brain studies on sensitive people. And one of them is clearly that their activity when they're looking at something subtle goes into very uh, higher levels of processing. And then the second thing in DOES is being easily overstimulated. And that's what we're dealing with right now. If you're gonna process things deeply, you're gonna get overstimulated sooner because you're using more of that brain stuff. Mm. E stands for emotional responsiveness. Some people might say emotional reactivity, but I prefer responsiveness. I say they're emotional leaders because they tend to feel what should be felt by everyone sooner than others feel it and more intensely. And the reason for it is very interesting. We don't process anything deeply if we don't have an emotional motivation to do it. Why do we give tests in order to motivate people to study for the exam? Why do we learn a foreign language better in the country? Well, no matter how good your, your instruction here, you're more motivated when you're there to learn it. So processing things deeply, if we really want to remember that phone number, we work on it so that it stays in our memory. Otherwise, it's gone. So, and of course, the more you are in an emotion, the more you process, the more you process your emotion, the more you're in it. So it, it has a bit of a positive feedback loop, but occasionally when the emotions are negative, a negative feedback loop. And I realized that I had wanted to say something before about the relationship between this trait and trauma. When I said it's innate, one of the ways that you see the difference with PTSD or even early trauma is that, number one, is that with PTSD, there's a clear time when it started, and the person was not sensitive before that. And this gets into assessment, which is a lot to me about taking a history, even though there is a measure of the highly sensitive person scale, which if you're interested, it is online at my website, hsperson.com. Mm -hmm. There's also one for the highly sensitive child and high sensation seeking. The sensitivity is, is very real and present from birth, or at least when we can recognize temperament, which is around three months. So, and the other thing is that the sensitivity, the DOES will be present, uh, sensitivity will be to all things, not more to the things that remind you of the trauma. Now, that's not to say that a sensitive person cannot have a diagnosis of anything. The last one, S, is sensitive to subtle stimuli. And that's kind of obvious. My husband and I were hiking yesterday, and we have here in California something called poison oak. And it grows everywhere. You may have something like that in the UK, because I know in the East Coast, it's called poison sumac or something else. But um, I'm so much better at spotting that stuff than he is that I have to go first on the trail. So it's a little bit sticky in the trail and to the right. Up here, there's some on the left. <laughs> and, and he can see it if he really works at it, but he doesn't distinguish it between the different leaves as well as I do. Then there's one other important fact about sensitive people, very important, and that is differential susceptibility. And this was discovered by Michael Pluis and Jay Belsky. And so I had already done research where, as I suspected, sensitive people with troubled childhoods were more likely to be anxious, depressed, shy, all of that. What they found, which I wish I had thought to look for, was that if a person had a good childhood, people with this sensitivity actually were functioning better than other people on many measures. Furthermore, if you put them into an intervention, one was done there in London with, with young girls who, pre-adolescent, all these girls were given a sort of a course in positive psychology and resilience to try to prevent them from becoming depressed when they became teenagers, as often happens. Only the girls who scored and the upper 30% on the HSP measures, HSP scale, got anything from the intervention. It was very interesting. Wow. Mm. So, find. so the thing we found with our brain studies is that they respond to positive stimulation, positive stimuli, experiences, images, expressions on people's faces, more than people who are not highly sensitive especially if they've had a good childhood, but anyway. So that 
makes us think that everyone has to have a strong response to negative experiences. It's part of our survival. But to have a strong response to positive, the survival strategy that's involved in sensitivity is to notice everything and to process things deeply more than others do. You might say, well, wouldn't everybody benefit from that? Yes, but if everyone were sensitive, there'd be no benefit in being sensitive. Somebody would have to become even more sensitive in order to get a benefit uh, in an evolutionary sense. And a lot of this comes from the media, the way that it just constantly goes with us. People want to hear about it, so they go with it. And then as they go with it, people hear about it more, and it, and it creates this... As I said, I think it has an archetypal basis for deep anxiety and alertness. I say highly sensitive people are more likely to survive this because they're going to be so careful about how they handle things. Mm, high provision. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those places where the trait is going to be very handy. Um, there's, there's times when it's not so uh, advantageous to be so, so aware of things mm. because it, it may not be useful. But so, sometimes it really is. In what ways might a highly sensitive person be more in tune with what's, what's happening and therefore survive better? Well, I think just when it comes to getting the mail or getting your groceries and how you clean things off, remembering to wash your hands, remembering to keep social distance, kind of following the rules more. I find, I'm sure you do too, that you're out in public and some people seem to be following those social distancing rules and some seem sort of oblivious. You know they've heard about them, but they're not um, taking care of themselves and they're not taking care of other people, but it's as much about taking care of yourself as other people. So Mm -hmm. I think there's other ways too, and this is where it goes into overstimulation, is paying too much attention so that it gets kind of exhausting. Yeah. So I think one of the things that therapists need to do is listen to how the patient is talking about their self-care and their care around the potential of catching the virus and see if it's, over, you know, if it's excessive and point out to them where they might not have to be so careful. Now, I think it's a very important time for maintaining self-esteem. So you want to praise people for their efforts they're making. But if it's exhausting them or they complain about it, you might say that, well, you might be able to cut this corner. Like, I am positive there's no virus in my house. Mm. So I don't wash my hands every 20 minutes because I'm not going to get it here. If I go outside, I try not to touch the railing uh, as I go downstairs. But if I have, then I use hand sanitizer. So I'm kind of compulsive, but I'm really not in a way, you know, because I, I realize I'm safe here. I have someone buying my groceries and what we do, and probably most people do it, is put them away for three days if I don't need them. And then I'm fine. I don't, they don't feel I have to sanitize everything that comes into the house as long as I don't touch it. I think it's really important to, to know yourself what the risk factors are. What is the likelihood actually of dying? And the likelihood is very low of course, you, of even getting it if you're, if you're doing the sheltering in place properly. The other thing about sensitive people is they do process their anxiety out to, the, out to the nth degree. And I think it helps them more to let them do that than to try to cut them off because that's in a sense saying stop being so sensitive. You're saying stop that depth of processing. Mm-hmm. And by the way, if you have patients who you think are highly sensitive and they don't know it, this is a wonderful topic to be into in therapy right now because it's not usually too traumatic or too too deep for the situation. And yet it takes us away a little bit from this topic. I find there's a difficulty, not a terrible one, but I notice that what people want to talk about is... I avoid the word pandemic because it sounds like panic to me. The the virus, the the, the issue the world is dealing with. Mm. And I think it's good to exchange enough information to, to keep things grounded. Yes, this is going on. But then to be able to change the subject is a very good idea, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think dreams can be helpful in that way, because even if the dream is about the situation, it now becomes the person's personal situation and story, and it very likely goes to the past, because one of the things that's going to happen is old traumas that are related to this will come up. Yes. And like one person told me that the way the government here was handling it was making her feel re-traumatized. She was like in a huge bad family with a bad father. And of course, all the changes we've had to make change is a big thing for sensitive people because everything they do has to be again processed. So they, the um, changes that we had to make at first so in sheltering place were very overstimulating. As we get more used to that, then we can take in a little bit more. Mm. Another thing is that I've found that sensitive people tend to have a lot of spiritual questioning going on or thinking or practices or paths. And if you don't know, <clears throat> if you don't know about those yet in your, in your patient, and if you're comfortable, I think it's good to let that come up and be discussed. It's, it's delicate. You don't want to lead someone into an area that they don't want to go into because it's also a very personal area. But I think it easily comes up in this situation. And I think it's really helpful to people to, to follow their path more right now and use this as a time to go inward, not so much to the traumas as to the deepest place they can get to. I really recommend people learning to meditate. Um, I'm fond of transcendental meditation myself, but anything that tapes you really, Christian centering prayer is almost the same thing. So if you have a Christian who wants to meditate, turn them on to Christian centering prayer. Because uh, what I say is what we always need, always need is the big picture. Because when we are not seeing it, we don't have all the facts. And when we're anxious or depressed, we have a tiny picture, right? We're just focused in on this thing. But as we expand it, we tend to calm down. Also, when we calm down, we tend to get the bigger picture. So it's a nice reciprocal thing. If you're, uh, so I really think that a kind of equanimity deep down, equanimity deep down with the emotions up here, you can do a process while you have some deep equanimity. And in fact, it's, well, why do we sometimes want people to take antidepressants? Because their emotions are taking them away from some equanimity. And they often describe, well, now I feel like there's a kind of a safety net that I don't fall through because I'm taking this medication. Well, something like meditation, yoga, things like that that calm you down can also be a safety net. Not perfect because they don't always calm people perfectly, but they can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And that's another just little thing I'll throw out. Our research finds that sensitive people are more affected by all kinds of medications. So um, I'd be very thoughtful about medications right now, increasing them or whatever. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I really like to find a psychiatrist who understands temperamental differences and that some people are more sensitive to medication than other people so that they can they will take that into account because many of the time I've seen a sensitive person go onto a medication and feel it's so terrible for them that they can't take it anymore and that's because they were given a large dose if they get a subclinical dose that doesn't happen so emotional regulation is an important issue and there's some research showing that, you know, there are many ways to, to get emotional regulation, including just knowing what your feelings are, getting um, support from other people. But they identified five ways that sensitive people are not as good as others at emotional regulation. So I thought I'd throw these out kind of quickly because I think therapists will understand these. One is they have trouble just accepting their feelings. They know their feelings, but they, they feel there's something wrong with them. Uh, and normalizing, especially, this helps with a sensitive person. It's normal to have strong feelings, so they don't need to feel um, that they're, they're odd. And secondly, they often have shame about their feelings, the same thing. And if some of the intensity of their feelings are because of past events, of course, you go back to 
this is not your fault. You may be responsible for trying to solve this in your adulthood, but you were not born with this, this kind of uh, intensity of feelings, things, things such as terrible depression or terrible anxiety. Think that you're not as good as others at regulating emotions. You know, everybody goes around looking like their emotions are pretty regulated, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes or what medications they might be taking. So self-comparisons, especially if you can compare yourself to other sensitive people and not to the other 80% or 70%, that's helpful. They tend to think it's going to last forever. And there's a line in a Rilke poem that I like, which is, no feeling is final. Which means no feeling that is final. Mm. No feeling is final. We think I'm going to be depressed forever. Yeah. But you, you aren't. It may come back quickly, but you aren't. It, something will change that. Maybe going for a walk will change it. Maybe watching a movie will change it. But it, something will come in. And that's kind of related to hope. That they yeah. tend to feel hopeless because they feel nothing's going to change and that they can't do anything about it. So the five are all kind of linked together. But uh, I think providing hope is an important thing. I mean, I was thinking um, it was bringing me onto the, the question of relationships and yes. thinking of this highly sensitive person with a need to process at depth and big feelings that are coming, getting stuck in these feelings. Mm -hmm. And if they're in a relationship with another highly sensitive person or a partner who finds their their big feelings quite overwhelming especially right now what might that look like that's a good question in fact we're finishing up a documentary not a not about this worldwide problem that we're having so if the sensitive person talks about their anxiety and the other person listens and is responsive very important then actually it'll bring out in the open what everybody else is feeling. This is that emotional leadership thing. Maybe the other person who's not as sensitive is feeling the same thing but isn't conscious of it. Yeah. If it's not conscious, it can't be digested. <laughs> it can't yeah. be processed. So I'd encourage sensitive people in relationships. It all depends on the relationship, of course, and how good or bad it is at the moment. Um, the thing with irritability is sensitive people must have downtime. They must have time away from other people. And I think in this situation, if you're living in close quarters or you're not allowed to leave your house at all, you're sure to get irritable at times. And I think that irritability is the first sign that you need to have some downtime. And if there's two rooms, get to the other room. There's actually some research my own survey research, their self-report is that they find parenting more difficult, but they're also more tuned to their child. And parenting is not uh, negatively affecting their relationship any more than any, anyone else, which is good news. But of course, these are statistics, these are not individuals. But the parenting difficulty, now there are two new studies that show that sensitive parents are not on average parenting quite as well as other people and we know why because they're overstimulated on that thing of permissive authoritative and authoritarian they go to both ends it's not like they have some philosophy that children should have their way all the time or should be kept in check all the time but when you're overstimulated what are you going to do you're going to say go do what you want or are you going to say go to your room and stay there for 20 minutes while i get some rest so what is the most important thing for a sensitive parent is to have help. Hmm? I, I, I think it's really interesting what you say about overstimulation, because if the highly sensitive parent is overstimulated, inevitably there's going to be ruptures with the children. But then yeah, if you can absolutely. repair it and talk about it and have a meeting, or that's really key, isn't it? Yes. In fact, I was thinking this morning about how all the advice about relationships applies to therapists and patient too. They're, you know, you may get irritated by something. It, repair the rupture is where you can find, if you can find a calmer place. You don't send patients inward if they're just going to get into deeper depression. Yeah. And that reminds yeah. me of something else that I've heard HSPs say, I'll say HSPs, 
um, is that they're afraid that their depression is going to come back. What now? And, yeah, like right now, like because things are happening. Uh, and of course, if they're not sleeping, it's, it's very likely to come back because we know. So neurotransmitters get worn down. There's a physical risk of depression, which of course is going to be much more intense for people who've got already a history of depression and of a troubled childhood. So this is a, I say, and I don't know how this would work, it would depend on the person, but I'd say face the fear. Because I think this usually works with sensitive people is to face the fear, not just dismiss it, but say, what would we do if you went and do another depression? And brainstorm how, what worked last time? And say, well, we'll both watch out for that. I don't think it's necessary that that will happen, but it could. There's something really helpful about awareness and this and sort of supporting a highly sensitive patient client in understanding that they have this sensitivity, that they have this tendency towards depression or overstimulation, that they need to manage manage that, which in many forms of psychotherapy that aren't too directive you might not do that. You might not be specific in that way. Yes, uh, and I'm a pretty non-directive depth therapist myself, but I think that temperament is a reality in a person, and temperament is invisible, but it has a huge impact on people. I think that temperament has as big of an impact as gender, but it's not visible. So, and in particular, sensitivities. And it's a very positive way to connect and to understand and not to blame, just like Jung's typology, Hmm. that that can be very helpful to take away the blame for a person being a certain way. Hmm. And we don't know exactly how they map onto genetics, but we know they're, they're very real. And when a person is strong and thinking and they're dealing with a partner who's strong and feeling, it's important to get that out in the open and not just to let it go on and on, and likewise with an individual. So I think there are cases where we can get very involved in this way without losing our generally hands-off way of being, which allows the unconscious come up in individuation to proceed without our interfering, which is why we do it that way. But still, there are times when you speak up in order to have that awareness. Certainly, when there's depression, for instance, we have to get into talking about depression and and how it's going to be handled and suicidal thoughts. We get more active in those situations. Mm -hmm. I have um, one one question as well that I wanted to pick up. You said... um, you, you spoke about the highly sensitive person and uh, thinner boundaries. Mm-hmm. And because of these thinner boundaries, more of a capacity to connect with sort of archetypal forces. Mm-hmm. You spoke of the plague archetype. I wondered if you could just speak a bit more about that. That sounds very relevant and fascinating. It's not something that I've given a lot of thought to because it's such an individual thing. But when I step back, I see that is the case. And I suppose one of the things I've noticed, but I I see so many highly sensitive people, it's hard for me to compare to other other people as patients. But we know that it's kind of important not to over-identify with an archetype or not to identify with, not to become the hero or to become the great mother. And whenever an archetype is really activated, there is a temptation to do that. And so I think in the case of the plague, there's a tendency to identify with, well, what is the image you get of a person during a plague? They're, they're panicked. They're trying to get away. They're afraid of being abandoned by those who love them as if they have it. And of course, now we have all this social distancing. And I know some some sense of people have been commenting on him feeling so isolated if they're alone and their friends seem to be connecting, but not with them. And that's that very sense of, of distancing that might happen during a, a plague. And 
this sense of helplessness because this thing attacking you, you can't see. So the helplessness is very intense. Yeah. And the over cautiousness and all that. So that's a, a one archetype. But we know the great mother, well, sensitive people um, can become extremely overgiving because of those thin boundaries. So they're just playing that archetype. Or the hero, a sensitive man especially, may feel that he must save the world and not his ego gets kind of lost in that process. So that's one way I think in which it would probably affect and probably affect the most would be archetypes overwhelming the ego because of those thin boundaries. And I think of those thin boundaries that we can strengthen them. We do it in social relationships. I've written a whole series of blogs on what I call graceful boundaries because we don't want to just cut people off, but we do need to know where our boundaries are and, and hold them. So this is another way in which thin boundaries, I mean, he really uses that term artfully, that it can be found in all areas of life. It helps you make, be creative because you, you see into things, you know, you're not stopped by the boundaries of things, you see the interconnectedness of things. Yeah. That's part of the spirituality. Some people feel that sensitivity, this is a scholarly article I read, um, suggesting that this trait is a reason that spirituality evolved in human beings because sensitive people were the ones who started thinking more deeply. And, well, and, and connecting to something sort of beyond. Exactly. Think more deeply, exactly. And then, well, where did we come from? Where are we going to? What else might there be that I can't see? Because there are things I can't see that exist. My thoughts exist. So maybe someone's thinking my thoughts or, you know, that, that vastness that opens up. With, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's also a problem for the ego. You know, the whole idea that dreams, people can be swamped by their dreams. It helps to talk about them just to, just to get out of that overwhelming feeling of, of the dream. I wonder if you, as a highly sensitive person, have any... Uh, kind of understandings of, of, of the virus and, and any kind of meaning behind it or? Well, I was walking the other day and I, I found something chalked on the street uh -huh. I, and I loved it. It said, we're staying more apart while the world is coming together. Yeah. And we don't know really, nobody, no matter how much they process this, can know the final result of this, but it's a worldwide experience that is going to change humanity. And I think there might be negative results, but I can't imagine that there won't be positive results. We are going to evolve as a species because of this. It's going to be very interesting to watch that. And Is there anything else that um, you feel that we haven't covered or that you would like to share? I have been meditating 49 years. Wow. And for quite a few of those years, I've been meditating maybe two hours a day. And I get a lot done. <laughs> I get a lot done. And so does my husband. We say, um, do less and accomplish more. Or we say, um, we rest hard and we work hard and we play hard. <laughs> um, and we have the energy for that. And it's given me a lot of equanimity that is almost embarrassing because the people around me get more worked up about things than I do. But it's a, it's a wonderful thing to develop and maybe it's getting older too, but I don't see it in a lot of older people. And, and it's just invaluable to have that in your life, however you can get it. And, and it's possible. I mean, I wasn't born that way. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I had to do a lot of inner work myself, a lot of time in Jungian analysis, I promise you. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's, and, and I feel that there was a tremendous synergy between the meditation and the analysis. It's hard to put into words why, but I felt that, to be very personal again, I felt that the, the transference and the depression and all the things that kind of came with that work was a trajectory I didn't understand towards something higher. 
and the meditation was facilitating that. And when I stopped the analysis, it was just like it, it kind of shot off because that energy was kind of released from, from the relationship in, into where it was meant to go in the first place, which I think is very interesting. And I, I now wonder whether people who have very strong transferences and maybe even a bit of, of quite a bit of stuff in childhood um, have have a easy path to to what you might call higher states of consciousness. I remember when I was interviewing different people for the original research before I was even going to write a book. Uh, I was talking with people of every age group. I talked to a woman in her 80s, and she was a therapist or a retired therapist, and she said. She said, the worse your childhood, the farther you're going to go in life. <laughs> well, I don't up, think we... Up the consciousness that, scale, you mean. Yes, on the, on the consciousness scale. I, I think it's a risky path, but it's sort of like, where else do you go? You yeah. know, you know, secure people, and they're happy. And actually, there's a study of, of attachment style and spirituality, and secure people are, oh, yeah, the universe is a good place, yeah. God's up there, somebody's up there guiding everything, and it's just great. <laughs> yeah. So there's a sort of internal need if there's high sensitivity and developmental early trauma to, to find something, which I think is the initial impulse to go into the therapy. But what right. you're saying is that as the therapy develops and a spiritual meditation commitment can, can kind of lead you yes. further yes. down. And that and I don't think, yeah, I don't think that therapists or analysts have to make a big deal about that, um, it, except that, well, subject of meditation with my clients is, often comes up after a long time. I always let them decide for themselves, and maybe I'll, they'll just find out. And I said, oh, that's okay, I was meditating, but I was just finishing, or something like that. And so then, if they ever become curious, then I talk to them about it, but I don't suggest it from my side. But I've had most of them start eventually. It must be in the consciousness, in the room, with you. It's absolutely, it's absolutely, exactly. Very I think so. And it sounds as if your meditation practice and, 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 and this connections that you have is something that really supports you as a highly sensitive person to, to feel grounded and safe. Yes. I, of course, I don't know how I would live without it now. And I, when I see sensitive people struggling, I just think of that thing again, that a, a, a calm mind can see the big picture. And when you calm the mind, you'll get the big picture. When you have the big picture, your calm mind is calmer. So sensitive people are prone to anxiety yeah. with, if they've had a good childhood. So we have to find a way to deal with that. And I don't know any other way because we don't do denial well. We're aware. There's a part right. of the brain called the insula and sensitive people, their insulas are, it's, it's called the seat of consciousness and it's more active in all of the research studies that we do. That really? It's there. Yeah. yeah. And, and then those the sort of av avoidant type defenses are just not available. So then in a situation that we're in now, those defenses don't kick in and almost those boundaries become a bit thinner. Right. When you have the collective consciousness so enlivened right now, it's very hard to push it away. In fact, I notice my meditations have changed. Ah. The, the, the deep peace is still there, but the, the ooh, like, like white noise is, is much stronger. And it's, 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 uh, it's the only explanation I can think of because I'm not paying much attention to the news. I have a deal with my husband who's not so sensitive. He listens to the news and every morning I say, is there anything I should know? And he yeah. says, basically, no. Yeah. <laughs> and We've then got to stay home. That's it. Yeah, right. And a lot of people die. Yeah, about the same as before. You know? yeah. <laughs> and uh, then I will sometimes listen to things that I can get that's more scientific. I've been doing that now because I'm curious. But it's part of the equanimity is I don't want to be pulled into that stuff. Well, where I live, at 8 o'clock at night, people come out on their porches and they howl like coyotes. Really? Really. And that is supposed to be in support of 
all the medical people. Now in New York, people bang on drums and yeah. yell. And we are doing that. We're yeah, doing that do on that. Thursday. So we're doing oh, that this evening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I figure in the UK, you wouldn't do it every day. That might be a bit, bit much. In fact, some, some days we're sitting at dinner at 8 o'clock and we hear people howling and we look at each other and say, I'm not up to it tonight. <laughs> yeah, I think once a week is probably pretty good. Well, thank you yes. so much. Bye. Bye.